Welcome everyone to the Family Conference 2020 uh, presented by Ramos University. The topic covered in this presentation is real versus perceived shame and our speaker is Dr. Luther Smith. Dr. Smith is the Dean of the, of the College de Department Chair, excuse me, Biblical Counseling at Calvary University in Kansas City, Missouri. Dr. Smith has his bachelor's in psychology, master's in religious studies, master's of art and marriage and family and doctorate of psychology. He has an exceptional ability to appropriately study and apply scripture to life in his presentation style while bringing biblical truths alive in tangible tools. I'm excited for that. Hello, Dr. Smith. Uh, um, welcome. I'm so glad to have you here. Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. Let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and then we'll, uh, we'll get started. Thank you so much, Lori, for your, uh, for your intro. Can everybody see my uh, my wonderful screen here? Looks good. Good. So uh, uh, let's go ahead and just uh, and jump right in. Um, again, uh, my name is Dr. Luther Smith. Here, uh, down below is my website. So if you uh, there's things there, I've kind of expanded it. Um, I keep adding stuff and then taking away stuff. So um, if you ever want to peruse there, um, there's uh, theology stuff there and videos and um, uh, my blog's there. So uh, um, if you guys have a chance and you want to look at it, you can take a look at that. All right, let's talk about uh, our topic here, real, real, and per real versus perceived shame. I ended up doing this uh, not too long ago, about a month ago, but it was for counselors. And now we're going to take a look at um, how um, um, we can either equip parents or how parents could be equipped in understanding what these things are, understanding what shame is, and, uh, and how to deal with both of them. Um, just, uh, just kind of a, a, a cursory example. Um, shame uh, is, uh, comes from the old English word and it's basically a feeling of guilt or disgrace. Confusion caused by shame, by disgrace, dishonor, insult, loss of esteem or reputation, shameful circumstances, what brings disgrace, modesty, private parts, or literally uh, comes from, the, from an old Norse word, literally meaning cheek redness. So if you uh, observe some of, the, some of the characteristics and qualities of shame, is shame is associated with guilt. Now, sometimes we talk about having a feeling of guilt, uh, which is understandable, but guilt is actually a positional word. It's, it's, it's a word, you know, you, you don't feel guilty. You either are or you aren't guilty, right? Um, um, now, you may feel feelings associated with that guiltiness, but, 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 but guilt is more of a positional word. Um, two, that shame is associated with physical effects, right? So cheek reddish, um, blushing, what we would call a downcast countenance, right? When a person looks down, they won't look you in the eye um, and stuff like that. Um, those are physical effects, maybe maybe even crossing their arms, right? And, and or maybe even soaking into themselves. Um, um, uh, as a matter of fact, just yesterday, I was talking to a young woman. Um, she's a young girl, as a matter of fact. Um, and she's about, uh, I believe she's about six or seven. She comes over our house often. And uh, I found out that she was not treating her uh, mom very well. And so I decided to approach her and basically talk to her about that and give her some imperatives, some, some things uh, that she needs to do in order to continue to come to our house because she likes coming to our house. And she, very, she did the very same thing. She would refuse to look at me. Um, um, she would refuse to, you know, I'd, I'd try to engage with her. She didn't want to engage. Uh, she was very downcast. Her face got really flushed. And so, and so she, it, it, it the shame was there. Um, um, uh, those phys and those physical effects associated with that. Um, shame is also associated with what I call, again, mind distress. We saw that in the definition, right? Confusion, um, you know, maybe not being, uh, um, able to know what to say. And there's a reason for that is because when a person has a, a, a feeling of shame, right, um, their, their brain goes on, on, I can't work mode. <laughs> so, you know, they, they end up, uh, because of the flush uh, nature of uh, uh, where they are 
and uh, and and what's going on in 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 the brain and stuff like that. They they can't talk, right? Um, because they feel threatened or or something like that. So it's it's associated with that also. So generally, uh, there are two types of shame, um, um, and we'll take a look at these just real briefly. One of them is called real shame, or what we would call objective shame. And another one is called perceived shame, or subjective shame. And as follows, real shame occurs when a person experiences all of the biological, that is the cheek, the, the, red, the redness, the cheek face redness, um, you know, even the even the downcastness, you know, the looking away, not creating eye contact, the social, they may withdraw, or they they may isolate, or they may insulate, right? Like our like our lovely young girl that I was talking to, right? She was she was insulating. She 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 went into herself, right, and refused to engage and interact. Um, the psychological qualities as well, maybe even perhaps beating your beating yourself up, someone beating themselves up uh, because they have this particular type of uh, of shame um, 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 that they're dealing with, um, and it's due to objective situations. For example, your child stealing a cookie from the cookie jar before bedtime. You tell them not to steal the cookie from the cookie jar. It's obvious they did, right? They 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 they, they violated or broke a, a rule and you are approaching them, asking them about that, and it is clear, right? There is no argument. What they did was, was they broke uh, and violated that, right? And then you have perceived shame. Um, this type of shame carries with it the same um, biological, social, a lot of the, a lot of the mind uh, 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 confusion and effects as real shame, as objective shame, it looks the same, right? But the perception is different, okay? So for example, as I put down at the, below, a child who believes that he or she is a failure. Now that's different from them saying that they failed, right? That they believe that because they failed the class that they are a failure. And that causes shame in an individual. That causes shame in a child. That causes shame in a young adult. They believe that they are worthless, that their value is attached to what, was, what, what they completed or what they didn't complete, right? It's very different, okay? So let's talk about real and objective shame first. I wanna start off in Genesis 3, just for a second. We'll go ahead and read this briefly. And then I wanna make some observations from the scriptures, because we find that both perceived and real shame are found in both of these places. Um, we find in Genesis 3, just very briefly, um, the entrance of the serpent in the garden and uh, the, de the deception um, of the serpent to Eve and the effects of all the stuff that takes place. Because then the eyes of both of them were open. This is after they ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Notice the behavior of Adam and Eve after they've done this, right? At first, they had no reason to hide from God amongst the bushes, right? But they withdrew, right? They withdrew from him. And the Lord God had to call to the man and ask him what happened, right? So we say they, they, they realized that what they did was wrong, this actually comes from uh, 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 Genesis 2. They were told not to, they could eat from any tree that they wanted, except this one, right? And, and God gave the stipulations for that. So they realized what they did was wrong, um, um, which is why they went and they hid, right? As a matter of fact, we see this in verse 10 as well. Uh, he said, uh, then the Lord ca called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself, right? Um, they attempted to cover up what they did, right? They sewed fig leaves 
together, right? And made for themselves loin coverings, right? So they, they understood what they did was wrong. They understood the reality of what they did and they attempted to try to cover it up with their own efforts, with their own attempts. We see that they hid from the creator in verse eight. Again, I find this to be very interesting that, that the, the, the association of God being a father and the association of the reflection of what fathers are supposed to do in light of training and instructing their children. Whenever children, it doesn't matter the age, um, when they do something that is wrong, they hide, they insulate, they cover, right? It's fascinating to see. And then lastly, uh, again, they were afraid of their creator. Again, this word afraid is the first time that it occurs in the book of the scriptures. There wasn't any fear or terror of God. But now there is, right? Because of the expectation of what they've done. So why is this real shame or objective shame? Well, again, we talked about this, right? Um, they were told not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 16. There was a clear delineation of what they were to do, what they were, what they were to avoid, what they were to stay away from, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat. It was objective. There was, you know, they didn't have to argue about this, right? This was clear, objective rules, guidelines. This, this is where it is, right? So why does God respond this way? There's, I wish we had more time to go through this, but this is pretty, pretty cool. Let's uh, start by highlighting some of the observations that God did when he's dealing with objective shame. One of them is that God asked questions of Adam and Eve. We see this in verse 10, in verse 11, and verse 12. In verse 10, he's, uh, or I'm sorry, in verse 9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? It's not like God didn't know where they were, right? He knew where they were, but he asked questions to, to, to draw out the, the man and Eve. Verse 11, who told you that you were naked? He doesn't say, hey, you're, you know you're naked, right? He says, who told you that you were naked? Have you come eaten from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat. It's not like God didn't know any of this. God know all, God knew all of this stuff, but he's asking questions because this is instructive for Adam and Eve. He wants them to get something here. God details the consequences of their actions. We see this in chapter 16 to 19, that God tells them what's going to happen to them as a result of eating from this tree. He gives them the consequences for this, that because of this, mankind is going to suffer. They're going to experience conflict. You're going to receive pain and childbearing. You're going to labor and toil. The ground is cursed because of you. I mean, you know, all of these things, he's laying out the consequences of their actions due to uh, the objective shame because their, their actions don't affect just them, but everyone else around them, right? God cares for them. Verse 20 and 21. We don't really look at this verse, these verses right here. We kind of gloss over these, but they're very, very important. Again, uh, it says, now the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. He cares for them even in the midst of all of this stuff. And then God drove them out for their and our benefit. So he, he, he lays down some boundaries for them. We see this in verse 23 and 24. He says, uh, um, uh, then the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hands and take also from the tree of life, eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out at the east of the Garden of Eden and stationed a cherubim with a flaming sword. He drove them out for their and our benefit. Could you imagine 
if, if Adam and Eve in this state took from the tree of life and ate in this position, there would have been no way for God to deal with this. We would have had this forever, but because of what he has done, as painful as it was to Adam and Eve, it was good for them and good for those uh, who would come uh, afterwards, even though it's difficult. It is instructive. So some principles to consider from this text. Obviously, this text is about how God has, ha, deals with man in a merciful and gracious way and in a just way. But there's some principles that we can learn here. First of all, listening intently to the person who has objective shame from what they've done. Being a listener. You notice in the text when God, when, when Adam gives and Eve gives an answer, he allows them to finish, right? So listening intently. Asking them questions only related to the issue. Um, God is really good at this. He asks them questions only related to what they're talking about, right? Give the consequences in relation to the situation and grieve over this. Um, obviously, in Genesis, when we read basically the fall of humanity, and this should put, in some sense, a, 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 we should grieve over this, like, wow, this is, this is really bad. This is the reason why things are the way they are. This, this is bad, right? In the same way, we should grieve over this as well. Man, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible that, this, that you did this because of the consequences it's going to yield, right? Uh, caring for them throughout the process, usually by caring for them personally, right? Again, showing that you love them, showing that you care for them, showing that you're there for them, um, saying that, right? And displaying that is important. And of course, limiting access, right? Building boundaries, right? until they comprehend and learn the lesson, right? That's kind of the idea here. Because again, they're, the, the shame that they're experiencing is, is warranted. It is warranted. They should be experiencing this, right? And that it may uh, uh, have uh, detrimental effects, right? And so limiting access and building boundaries around that, not, ju not just because of the effects that it yields, but so that they won't have to experience this shame anymore, right? That's kind of the idea. So very briefly, let's talk about perceived shame. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Oh my gosh, I, I could spend a whole 30 minutes on this one. But the, essentially, uh, verse, Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to 13, talks about how the Pharisees were using the law um, in an improper way, okay? They were using it for righteousness instead of, and, and, and judging and evaluating people based upon that, right? Oh my goodness. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 13, okay? Matter of fact, I'll just go ahead and read uh, just a snippet of this. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. He goes, uh, um, he, I'll start at verse 9. Um, I'm actually, I'll start at verse 8. Um, he says, uh, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. These are man-made rules that they had set up that nullified the commandments of God. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandments in order to keep your tradition. All right. Um, he says, that you, you, uh, you, you claim that you honor me or honor God by these laws. But instead, you set up all of these, these laws, and these laws basically throw people into shame. They condemn them and, and drive them away from me. So there was an old tradition that was established among the Pharisees, right? And they uh, had assumed that if you um, uh, uh, held this law, that you wouldn't break the others, right? But these laws that they set up were not God-given. Uh, the Pharisees questioned Jesus. We see this in verse 5. 
of this text here, Jesus rebukes them for their hypocrisy because of the fact that they set up all these man-made laws and, and were, were, were holding people to these standards. They were being actors. They were, they, were, they were posing as if they were righteous, right? And then they would shame people who didn't do these, these oral laws. In the verdict, they invalidated the truth of God, mainly that God was gracious and merciful, right? And why do we come to that conclusion? Why does Jesus respond this way? Well, here's some points to consider. One is that the ordinances contained in the law were also intended to guide their conduct. That's part of what the law of Moses was given to the nation of Israel for, was to guide their conduct. And every single conduct that they had that was given to them was an expression of grace and mercy that was underscored under this law, okay? The law was to underscore the attributes of God, uh, not, not only that he was holy and just, but that he was law, that he was loving, kind, merciful, gracious, that he was patient, and that they were to exhibit those. Okay? The law was intended to show the need for a savior. Obviously, we see this in the law as well. It pointed again to God's grace manifest in Christ. And, the, and again, the law also underscored the Savior himself, as it promised that one would be sent, right, to uh, the nation of Israel and the world. So how does one deal with subjective shame? That is shame that is perceived, right? This is shame that is not grounded in any type of a, uh, objective rule or anything else like that. Someone has, has created a law in their own minds that they believe that they have to live up to right? And they don't. How do we deal with uh, uh, individuals, children, young adults, even adults, right? One, again, listening intently, asking them questions only related to the issue. Doesn't this look familiar? We don't, we don't change all but two we challenge the perception of the person. This is what Jesus does in Mark 7. He challenges the Pharisees and their, and their false rules that they've placed on themselves and everyone else, right? And then we care for them throughout the process, usually by caring for them personally. Again, challenging them by asking them questions and leading them to the truth. So some things to consider. One, conduct may vary depending on the factors. For instance, you may approach uh, someone differently. For example, when I'm, when I'm talking to young children, uh, like that seven-year-old, um, 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 what I usually like to do is I like to go down, I like to go over and kneel down and look at them face to face. I like to get on their level. Um, I think that that's very important, okay? Now, when, as an adult, you may not do that, right? You may just approach them as they are, okay? For young adults, um, I would like to, I, you know, I'd like to have them sit down next to me or, or right across from me so that I can see them and talk with them and see their facial expressions and stuff like that. That gives me indicators of where I need to go. So you, the conduct may vary depending on factors. Asking questions is a good thing. Sometimes, especially with young adults, we assume uh, uh, that, um, that young adults, when their lips are moving, they're lying. <laughs> um, we don't give them the benefit of the doubt usually. And, and I understand that. I understand the reason why that is. But, but asking questions is a good thing because it helps draw out. We're not assuming anything about the person that we're talking to right? We're, we're asking them questions because we, we want them to see that we are, we are attempting to try to get to the truth, and we want to hear what they have to say, okay? It, it, it increases uh, efficacy. It increases um, uh, um, um, uh, positive interaction. So asking questions is a good thing, and we want to ask them in a way that's not threatening either. We want to do it in a way that is inquisitive, right? Grace is the goal. Remember, they all, especially for those who are, who are dealing with objective shame, they already know that they already know they're guilty. They already know that we don't have to rub it in, right? We don't have to, you know, grind it in. 
We don't have to continue to, to, to pummel that. They already know that. What we need to display is grace, right? They need, and, and, and that needs to be constant. Consistency is the goal. If it is, if it is objective shame they're dealing with and something like that, and there are boundaries that need to be set up to continue to keep those boundaries there and talk about them every now and then, right? You know, return back to it maybe a, a week from now or, or, or two weeks from then, from when, the, uh, when it occurred, um, the touch base to, to, to talk about these things, right? To be consistent. If it is uh, perceived, right that if someone's dealing with low self-esteem or, or 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 something like that to continue to ask hey how are you doing we talked about this a week ago i just wanted to check in and see how you're doing um how are you doing with that you know what what's what's going on you know tell me tell me your thoughts right consistency is always the goal so conduct asking questions the exhibiting grace and consistency you can talk about how you feel in relation to how they feel as well Okay, um, I feel um, disappointed that you took the cookie out of the cookie jar, right? Because it gives them a, a, a focus of that their actions, especially if it's objective, shows that it didn't affect just them, right? But, but everyone else that they're around, right? And even the subjective, right? Because you have this, uh, this perceived view about yourself, it's affecting uh, me because I, I want to connect with you, right? Avoiding the consequence because of the negative feelings involved is not dealing with it. We have to confront this. God does it in his word. He confronts this all the time, and he expects us to do the same. Now, the way that we confront is, is obviously um, uh, um, um, a point to consider, but we never, ever should avoid the consequences, right? We always have to give that. And then have them understand that real and perceived shame has ramifications for them and for others, right? Um, that uh, this doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? But that, uh, you know, especially being in relationship and interaction, um, that, that, that um, this shame has effects for others um, around us, as well as those who are dealing with it. Hey, look at that. I finished on time. I think I think that's I think I I think I deserve a star for that one. <laughs> any um any questions? Um I would ask again um as Lori had, had had underscored, if you guys have any questions, uh just go ahead and uh just unmute your mic and then um and then uh and then I'll answer your questions from there. Oftentimes, especially if they're very little, right? If they're if they're young, you know, if they're if they're possibly young young middle age or um, uh, young children, uh, uh, you know, we don't want them to hurt, right? We don't want them to experience negative feelings, right? Because we we want the best mm -hmm. for our kids, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, let's take our cue from 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 God Himself, right? I mean. He gives the stipulation, he gives the outline, he gives the rule, um, he gives the command, they break it. Mm -hmm. and, and he sets down the consequences. Um, and those consequences are disastrous, right? Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, he lays them down anyway, right? Mm -hmm. I think that we need to learn that, right? That, that our children, um, they need to learn, you know, uh, uh, positive as well as negative when we're talking to our counselees uh we don't you know we don't uh you know in some ways we don't sugarcoat it you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. we we tell them you know this is this look at what happened because of mm -hmm. the actions and the consequences that have happened right mm -hmm. um, um and so i i i i find that to be probably the biggest challenge of this is mm -hmm. because parents when they when they see the shame on their faces when they see the downcast they they want to they want to soften the blow right um yeah. when it's when it's objective shame i i don't don't no don't don't soften it don't soften the blow right but instead embrace them while they're experiencing that 
So an example I'll give was uh, this young girl that I talked to yesterday, right? Uh, she came home. She likes to come over our house. She loves she loves hanging out with the misses and 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 the little misses, and she enjoys that because she she she's she's basically connected and we have a bond right with her. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we found out uh, that she was essentially uh, not she wasn't she wasn't respecting her her mom. You know, right? She would yell at her mom, scream at her mom. Um, you know, when she when her mom asked her to do something, she wouldn't do it. And so we've been working with this family. Well, anyway, um, I heard it. So what I did was, as I said, is that true? Are you are you disrespecting your mom? And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you see, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And she, yeah, you know, she, yeah. I mean, I mean the flush face, the down, I mean, it was it was it was there. And mm -hmm. I I didn't I didn't let up. I said, are you disrespecting your mom? Is that true? Mm. She went, you know, mm -hmm. she didn't answer yes. She kind of, and I said, it is very important that you don't do that. You mm -hmm. understand? You're, you know, that you only have one mom. She loves you, you know, this, that, and the other. She, I was like, I better not hear you do that again. Otherwise, you cannot come over our house. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I can't have you disrespecting your mom. Because if you do mm -hmm. that, who's to say that you'll disrespect? You won't disrespect us. Mm -hmm. I was like, and and I was like, is that is that clear? And she went. Mm -hmm. I said, I, we love having you here. We love having you here. You you know you you you're such a bright young girl. You know you're really fun to be around. You're really cool. You know what I'm saying you know my daughter loves you. Uh, my my wife adores you. She'd adopt you if she could. Um, you know I I think you're just a wonderful girl. You're very smart. I said, well we can't have this, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? That that that's a, that is a perfect example. We didn't let up, right? The boundaries were made clear, and at the same time. We, we gave her grace in that situation as well. Uh, let's see. Um, do you have any examples on how to deal with perceived shame as a family? As many times this is even a generational pattern it's based on critical parents, perfectionism. Oh, this is so good. <laughs> this is a great question. Uh, I love this. As a matter of fact, I just got finished um, uh, not too long ago, counseling um, a, a young girl who lives in a family just like this, just like this. This is especially within uh, the evangelical Christian community. This is this is this is common, um, um, and I've had to watch out for this. I've had friends that have had to watch out for this. So this is this is really good. So when you're dealing with um, usually what happens is you don't deal with the family wholesale. Usually what time, what happens is you'll, you know, the, 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 the child will go off the rails and then you'll have to work with the child. And then all of a sudden the child will, 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 you know, they'll change and they'll, you know, uh, be consistent and then the family will be brought in. However, if you, if you do have a family that you work with all together, okay. I would ask a couple of questions. First of all, I would ask them, um, do you as a family understand the word grace? What is, what is, what does grace look like? What does it look like to you? Can you define that or describe that? Right. And then we would, uh, you know, define it or describe it, talk about it. Right. Um, I would bring examples, right? Examples from the scriptures, maybe not overt if they're unbelievers, right? Uh, uh, maybe talk about it in, in, in such a way that, that, that if I were to give you a present or a gift, is that, is that gift something you've earned? Something that you deserve? Or, is it, I'm, or am I doing it out of love for you? Talk about it in those terms, right? And so after the, 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 the word has been defined, I would ask them, in terms of this particular issue, maybe perhaps they're having fights with their children or something like that. In this particular issue, how would you, uh, what would grace look like in this particular arena? What would it look like, right? So how would you guys talk to each other? How would you, what would you guys be doing? And how would it look different from what you're doing now? 
Does that make sense? Getting them to, to not only understand the concept of grace, but see it practically, right? Thank you. Um, um, and then after we talk a little bit about that, I would ask them, so if you were to implement this, right, after going through and kind of talking, if you were to implement this grace and, and, and do it, how would it change your family structure? How would it change the way that you see yourselves? How would it change the way that you see um, others, right? And then from there, we would begin to start to uh, give skills, maybe perhaps uh, doing a speaker listener, right? Um, um, taking turns, right? So maybe uh, having like a sponge ball or something like that, right? Because the whole purpose is to express grace within the discussion, right? And, uh, and then dealing with the perfectionism. So are you going to make mistakes when you do this? Of course you are, right? Of course you're going to make mistakes. Uh, when you tried to ride a bike, uh, did you, uh, were you perfect the first time you did it? You know what I'm saying? Were you the, per were you perfect the first time you did it or did you get, or did you pick them back up? Did you scrape off the knee? Did you kiss the boo boo? Did you wipe it? And then tell them to get back on the horse and then do it again. Right. You know what I'm saying? See, God, God understands that we not only are we not only are we fallen creatures, but we also have limited perspectives and we don't see things. That's why he tells us that we always need to grace each other. Right. So I would I would I would start from there. Defining grace. What would it look like? How, how can we do it in the family? what the effects of what it would have in the family and then building those skills based upon that reality. We got time for, for, for uh, one more. Or I can just wax poetic for four minutes too. I can do that. <laughs> I think that uh, just to kind of underscore your point, um, um, that, 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 that really grace is the antidote for shame. It really is, um, and especially as us as believers. I mean, we experience shame before God when we when we sinned, right? Um, and God has removed our shame by His grace, right? Um, Titus two. It is grace that instructs us to deny ungodliness and live righteously, sensibly, and godly in this present age. Great grace is grace is the key, right? Um, um, and and especially within the realm of the family, um, um, you know, if the family is indeed the underscore by which God has established this reality and how we are to live. I mean, even the body of Christ is described as a family. We're described as brothers, sisters, right? We have mothers in the faith, uh, fathers in the faith, daughters in the faith. Uh, 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 Paul refers to Timothy as his beloved son, right? And so, and so grace is, should be found not just within the, the, in, in the unit of the, uh, of the body of Christ, but also underscored in the unit of the family. I think that's very, very important. And that's, and, and um, uh, it's definitely not more, more law. <laughs> it's, 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 it's more, it's more grace. I don't know exactly if, if healthy is the word. I, I, I do know that there is a, a shame that is, that is, that is beneficial. So, so, you know, if I feel shame because I, I, I believe that a certain, that I used to believe that a certain group was inferior to me and I feel shame about that, well then, yeah, that I, I would say that that's helpful right? Because that gives me a, 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 an anchor, right? By which now I don't, I don't view that anymore. And I'm, and I, I was ashamed that I, I believe that, right? But to stay there, right? To stay there and yeah. go that I need to purposefully shame myself all the time to show uh, this other group that I'm, I'm doing my due diligence. That's law, now you're you're shaming yourself to mm -hmm. show that you're just to them does that make sense mm -hmm. um um so i would i would say that yeah you know if a person you know has a light bulb moment i, I know I'm, I'm probably going over but that's okay um uh, i if someone has a light bulb moment 
and and they go, oh man, you know, I I believe that these people were just, you know, I I thought that they were inferior to me. You know what I'm saying? And and not only that, I treated them as such. And that was bad, right? And that was wrong. And I shouldn't have did that. We want to amen that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because that's not reality, right? You know, every person is created in the image of God, right? And 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 everybody is is is, is significant, right? Not because of their ethnicity, but because of the creator right? Because they're, they're created in God's image and we could learn so much, right? From each other. Um, um, but to stay there and to beat yourself up and go, oh my gosh, you know, I, you know, I'm such a, I'm such a, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm inherently racist or, or I, you know, I do this to stay there is to put a law on yourself. And that's, that's not cool. Thank you all for joining us at the Family Conference 2020. We hope you have gained new insights and tools you can use. We will keep you informed of any upcoming events with Rhombus, and you can check our website at www.gorhombus.com. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lori. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.